Hi, my name is Dr. Patricia Price. I am a licensed psychologist in private practice and my specialty is eating disorders and in particular, uh, anorexia nervosa. I um, decided a couple weeks ago after speaking with a colleague, Dr. Dan Van Ingen, um, that I wanted to start a video series educating people who uh, are interested about the field of eating disorders um, and I'm not quite sure where this will be headed. This is my first video conference uh, session or um, series, but um, I'm excited about it. And I hope that if anyone has questions um, after each video that I create, that they will send those to me. Um, and um, maybe I can, that can steer the direction of the next video. Um, I have, a huge passion for treating eating disorders. And um, I've trained with some of the best professionals in the world uh, over the course of the last 12 or so years. And um, I thought I would share some of that knowledge there. And uh, I'd like to do one video at least on some of the myths about eating disorders and uh, the misconceptions, uh, particularly about anorexia and help people to understand uh, what things, what messages are out there that the general population might not even recognize as um, very attached to the eating disorder community, um, maybe turn on some light bulbs of, of awareness for some people uh, and parents in particular. Um, I thought it would be a good idea to take this first video to give you some background um, and understanding of myself and hopefully build some credibility um, for why it's even, why you should even listen to these videos. Um, and and uh, I thought part of that has to be telling my own story. Um, and uh, it, it really underlines why I have spent my, I'm focused my, focusing my entire career on treating eating disorders. Uh, so I will just begin with that. Um, I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota. I was the youngest of five kids. I had a very normal upbringing, two parents. My grandma lived with us actually. Um, my mom was a teacher at my school. Uh, my dad was an IBMer, pretty normal um, Irish Catholic family, um, nothing to noteworthy in, as a child. I was young, the youngest, as I said, and um, just kind of lived a free, free and wild childhood, I guess. Um, when I was in middle school and in uh, eighth grade, I had, I had a very best friend, I should say, that I had from about age four on, who went all through grade school and high school, or grade school with me in middle school, and um, went to our church. Her, her parents, her dad worked with my dad. Her parents were good friends with us through church. Uh, I spent many weekends at their house. Well, in February of my eighth grade year, um, she didn't show up for school one Thursday and uh, neither did her brother and no one really thought anything of it. But um, by eight o'clock that night, it came to fruition that um, we got a phone call and the entire family had been ax murdered um, and found in their Rochester home. Um, I should say by their entire family, both parents, my friend Diane and her youngest brother who was in fifth grade. We were, we, they were, he was three years younger than us. Um, major shocker to the system, major trauma, um, totally out of the blue. Um, and then even even worse, the next day we discovered that um, the murder was committed by her 10th grade brother. Um, so he was like a brother to me. I spent many, many hours with him during my childhood uh, and with the family. And this was in a small Catholic community um, and in the Catholic school system in a small town. And um, the way it was handled, it was 1988. There was no concept of this kind of major tragedy happening. And so 
no one really knew what to do. And, and, in, and instead of doing anything, everyone just kind of tried to shove it under the rug and pretend it didn't happen. Um, needless to say, that left a lot of kids in massive crisis. Um, we went to school the next day. It was like everyone just kind of wanted to pretend it was back to normal, but it really wasn't, especially for the, those closest to the family. Um, in the year that followed, um, I ch did my best to try to be normal. You know, I tried to make new friends. I tried to get involved in activities at school. I was the class president. I was joined the tennis team. Uh, I went out of my way to kind of recreate a new identity for myself that did not include this friend. Um, however, um, you know, I, I think I went into a deep, dark fog and depression without even recognizing it. And in the years 1988, 1989, 1990, no one really understood mental health problems and therapy was very taboo. Um, my family was totally um, unsavvy about the, the psychology therapy world. And, uh, and really, if they saw any problems happening, kind of discounted it as something I'd snap out of. Um, but during that time, I also, during this depression phase, I also began not eating and losing weight. I don't know if it was conscious at the time or unconscious, but um, I remember being complimented on it at first uh, by coaches, friends, other people's parents, my parents. Um, I was never overweight. I was just a normal sized kid, average, probably smaller than average actually. Um, and by the end of my freshman year, I had lost a significant amount of weight, but really again, my parents didn't believe in psychology and it was really hard for my for them, I think, to understand that it was a disease. Um, and I don't think they had identified it as anorexia at that time quite yet. Um, anyway, uh, long story short, by the beginning of my sophomore year, things were starting to really, really go downhill. This was about 18 months after the MERS. And um, I don't remember much of my the beginning of my sophomore year. Uh, except that it was difficult. Um, my parents began bringing me more and more to the doctors. It was the Mayo Clinic in town, and I did start to hear the word anorexia nervosa, uh, or the diagnosis. Uh, so uh, my parents began kind of just pushing me and getting mad at me. Um, they thought it was silly that they were having to pay medical bills to treat something that seemed so easy to fix, right? You just eat, dang it, and um, the problem will go away. Why can't you just eat? Um, by Christmas time of my sophomore year, I had um, diminished quite a bit. And um, I'm not sure what happened, but I, in my memory at least, which was really bad back then because I was so underweight, um, I feel like there was some pressure from Mayo that if my parents didn't do something serious uh, to help me, then there was going to be some repercussions for them um, or some legal actions taken. And at that time, um, they decided to put me into, immediately they decided to put me into the cardiac unit at St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester, uh, which is part of the Mayo, program, Mayo system. Um, so I spent two weeks at that time on the cardiac unit. This was a little after Christmas of my sophomore year. Um, and they, that was a really inappropriate fit for an anorexia patient. Um, I would escape from there. I'm, you know, thankfully I'm years past that. So I have no problem talking about that. But, um, when I look back, I think, wow. Um, and actually I blog, I'm creating a blog that goes along with this very video series. So in the blog, I'm giving much more detail about um, the, the things that I was doing during that time. But needless to say, during that two weeks, I lost even more weight, wouldn't eat, 
Um, and then after the two weeks, they, they decided to put me into a general psychiatric unit that was locked. Um, there was no, back, that was 1990, there were no, um, it was the beginning of 1990, there, was, there were no eating disorder clinics in the state at that time that were specifically eating disorder um, focused. And so they would just put eating disorder patients in with other psychiatric patients. So I got to spend, well, I spent the next four months of my life living in the lockdown psychiatric unit at St. Mary's Hospital with all sorts of kids uh, with different diagnoses between about the ages of five and 18. Um, toward the end of that, I was able to check myself out at the beginning of the day, walk to high school, um, go to high school at my normal high school, and then walk back home and check myself back into the psych unit. <laughs> home was the psych unit. Uh, and I only share that that aspect of it because I have a lot of patients now who uh, are mortified at the idea that, that anyone in their school will find out about that they're even getting treatment for an eating disorder. And I think back to that time and I, I didn't think anything of it, I don't think, but um, it had to be super weird to see me um, walking back to check myself into the psych unit as my friends were driving home past me and waving. Um, so anyway, um, I did get up to my goal weight, which was the requirement for getting out. There was no specific eating disorder treatment uh, provided for me. It was all about just restoring lost weight, getting to a weight, and that was gonna be the magic cure. Uh, it wasn't. I got out uh, in about the end of April and um, appeared to be doing pretty well. People complimented me, thought it was great. I had a few creepy, uh, you know, people asked me how I had done it, which was at, even at that time, very disturbing. Um, but I mean, how I had lost weight, uh, they would ask me what the tricks were. And, uh, but otherwise people are mostly complimentary of me looking better and, and being healthy. And I proceeded to do my junior year and senior year um, without any therapy or intervention. Um, it appeared, I guess, on the outside that I was doing pretty well, but um, I was absolutely falling apart on the inside. I developed all sorts of different eating dis disorder behaviors. Uh, and that's, that's one thing that is really common is if you have a low weight eating disorder or any type of eating disorder, but particularly low weight, um, it's super uncommon to go from that low weight eating disorder straight back to recovery. It's much more common to go through phases where eating is all over the map, bulimia, binge eating. Uh, at one point I was about 20 pounds over my goal weight. Um, I was every diagnosis of an eating disorder that you can think of. Um, and then some maybe. I spent my senior year, I, if you look at my senior photos, you can see about four different patties um, just in that one school year. Um, and then I went, I went away to our family school, uh, which was Creighton University. That was where all of my other siblings went down in Omaha for, for college. Um, down there, I had my first big relapse into anorexia. I was hyper focused on getting straight A's. I was super obsessional about um, my classwork. I needed to be getting 120%, not just 95%. Um, and I slowly began losing weight again. And I relapsed hard um, by my sophomore year. Christmas time of my sophomore year, which was ironically the same as in high school, Christmas time of my sophomore year. Um, but Christmas time of my sophomore year of college, things had really gotten bad. Again, there was no eating disorder treatment to be found anywhere, at least at least that my parents found um, for me. So I ended up dropping out of college um, at that time and moving back home with my parents. I never went back for my second half of my sophomore year. Um, I spent that year, that, that semester working full time and really not getting any treatment, but at least taking a step back from life and um, 
refocusing my energies on getting better. Uh, I also transferred schools to a much closer to home school, um, not as academically rigorous school. Um, and it was awesome for me. It was a great decision. It was probably one of the best decisions of my life. I really loved that, that school. Um, transferred to St. Mary's in Winona. And it was just, um, it was, it was just great people. And I got to kind of reform my, my new identity, and even though it was not um, as prestigious of a school. Uh, when I was done with college, I had an education major. That was my undergrad degree was education. And I wanted to teach elementary ed. I found my first teaching job, which I was so excited about in a tiny little town up in Northern Minnesota at a little teeny tiny Catholic school. And I was teaching kindergarten full time. Um, went up there, was living alone, had no idea who anyone in this town was. Um, and I, I got really depressed again, super depressed, uh, and slowly began losing weight again. And that was, that was my last big relapse. So I had two major relapses after the initial one. Um, but I had quit that job uh, about a month early before the school year was even done. It was really horrible because I had to leave my kindergartners and of course they didn't know what was going on. And um, I was very, very sick again. And I had to move back to Rochester, move back to my house um, with my parents and um, try to figure things out again. I went to a therapist who was great, but didn't really, spe she saw a lot of eating disorder patients, but she didn't necessarily have any um, specific training in, um, in empirically supported treatments for eating disorders. And really there weren't any quite yet. I mean, there weren't, they weren't great, greatly established. Um, and so I started a job teaching nearby in Rochester and I spent two years doing that. And then I started into a master's degree program simply to get paid more as a teacher, honestly. But I did it in counseling and, and psychology. Um, I spent two years doing my master's prog program at night while I, was, uh, while I was also teaching during the day. And when I got done with that, I should say I was teaching eighth grade math as, at the time. During those, I went from kindergarten to, to teaching eighth grade math. When I got done with my master's degree, um, I was in a serious relationship that has now turned into my marriage. Um, we've been married for 18 years now, but back then that was about 20 years ago. He, my husband, my now husband said, are you sure you don't want to go into, into something besides teaching? And uh, that was really a gift because I never thought about changing careers, but that was like a light bulb went off in my head and I thought, wow. So I started to look at things that I could do with a master's degree. At that time, nothing, nothing. So I went back to get my doctoral degree um, in psychology and uh, went back for four more years full time. Well, so I should say from about age 28 on, I was uh, pretty much like recovered uh, from my eating disorder. And that's why I went into my doctoral program at age 28. And it was like, I felt like things were just falling into place. Finally, I thought, wow, I have all of this experience with, with dealing with my own eating disorder. Why don't I start? I had heard that there were these new therapies and new treatments um, that were showing great signs of, I thought they were too good to be true at first. And I barely believed that it could uh, be the case that there was a treatment that could help with anorexia specifically. But I decided to spend the next four years of my doctoral program uh, really looking into this and trying to become an expert in it uh, and maybe combining some education and experience to help others who were going through the same thing I had been through. Um, and it's been a, an amazing journey since about the late 90s, there have been some really great treatments um, found. And I've gotten to train with the founders of those treatments. Um, and it's just been 
it's just been, it, I, I have to say it's, it's so interesting to see how things were for me back in the late 80s, early 90s compared to how things are today. Um, and that's part of what I want to talk, talk about in these, this video series. But one thing I can say, um, when I first was hospitalized, they really back then blamed parents for anorexia. They, they thought, you know, the parents were too rigid and the kids were trying to be control, uh, control the only thing that they had control over, which was food. Um, and so they didn't allow me to see my parents for the first two weeks for sure. And then um, my parents had to get passes to come see me at the hospital. Um, and it was kind of like based on how well I was doing. If I was doing well, they could come see me. If I wasn't, they, they were restricted from seeing me. Um, today, um, there's a therapy called family-based therapy, which is the gold standard therapy for adolescent eating disorders and in particular anorexia nervosa. Um, Family-based therapy completely puts the um, trust in parents to do things on their own at home uh, that one time the treatment staff would have had to do it in hospital. Um, that's just one major shift, major, major shift. And I can explain that more in future series and how all these things came about um, or in future videos. And I'm so excited, I get so excited to share all this stuff because it's so awesome that there's help for patients now that didn't used to exist. Um, so I've decided to really dedicate my career life um, to using what I know from my own experience. And, you know, eating disorders are literally pretty difficult to understand unless you've been through them, especially anorexia. There's so many misconceived, you know, misconceptions about it. And um, it's just a very, very tricky illness to get inside the head of um, unless you've been there. And, and I, I really value my experience now. Um, do I wish it hadn't happened? Yes, but, um, but am I happy that I can use my experience to help others? Yes, I am. Um, there's also, the, you know, the FBT is really the gold standard for adolescents and those living at home. Um, it can also be used as in adults uh, who have a support person around, but um, there are other treatments such as cognitive behavioral therapy enhanced um, by Christopher Fairburn, which is uh, the gold standard really right now for adult eating disorders, particularly for binge eating disorder and bulimia. And um, yeah, I just figured that I'd share my story first to kind of give myself some credibility, uh, let you know that I've really worked hard in, um, you know, in, in getting as much education as I can about the empir empirically supported treatments. There are some great hospitals around the country now that specifically work with eating disorder patients. Um, there are two or three now in the state of Minnesota. Unfortunately, they're all in Minneapolis. So, um, but it's growing. The point is it's growing. The understanding of eating disorders is growing and um, that's a good thing. The bad thing is that the culture in which eating disorders are fostered seems to be also growing. Um, and I can spend some time talking about that uh, again in a different video. Um, but I, I will leave it here today. If you, have, if you watch this video and you have any specific questions for me, could you please um, send me an email? My email address is patty, P-A-T-T-I, at Dr. Dr. Patricia Price .com. Uh, I would love to be able to uh, tailor these videos to specific needs and uh, requests. Thanks. See you next time.